Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. A uh, special welcome to any guests or visitors that we have today. Thanks for being with us. And also, welcome to all that are going to be viewing here online. Uh, thanks for joining us. A few announcements before we get going. Um, number one is that we're doing a prayer initiative right now. Right now, we're going to emphasize praying for the lost and for the disconnected from Jesus and his church. And and as a little reminder, uh, we have these cards you can pick up at the welcome table um, in the narthex. Uh, you can keep it as a bookmark in your Bible. You can write names of people you know disconnected from Jesus and his church and pray for them here for the, the summer. And we have opportunities for you to invite people to join us at, in what we're doing as church in worship. Or we have VBS coming up on July 17th. It'll be... a uh, uh, just a half-day thing on Saturday, July 17th here on this campus. campus, And then on the 18th, we were having a dedication of this um, renovations in the sanctuary and in the narthex here in this building, too. So a couple opportunities there. We're going to have lots of fun um, stuff coming up in July. They can invite friends, family, neighbors, coworkers to join us um, as we follow Jesus. Um, other announcement. We, uh, Pastor Bingenheimer, has applied for a grant from the LWML to supply um, our partners in Tanzania, the Ma Mwa Dewey Lutheran School, I think is how you say it, uh, with uh, some medical supplies for their clinic that they just started up there at that uh, school and in that town. So uh, $68,000 from LWML to help this medical mission and this clinic in, in Tanzania. Uh, praise God for that. Uh, they having given us the grant. Also, um, Pastor Girdle has set us up with a, an awesome resource called Right Now Media. It's online web-based um, source for a bunch of uh, resources for Christian teaching and discipleship. And we have a video uh, to show you with more information on that. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the word of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum, and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right now, media, it's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep Pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically based videos. 
Get equipped. Get inspired. Exciting is that? All right, let's uh, begin worship with our first song. Please stand. <laughs> Name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We kneel or sit in confession, taking a moment of silence before our God. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, God, word and me, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our poor. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. The epistles from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as we sing the Alleluia in verse. gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, 
Lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease." While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but is sleeping. But they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, Arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Fear and faith. Fear and faith. So much of the life of a Christian can be boiled down to these two things, fear and faith. Ever since Adam and Eve ate that piece of fruit in the garden, the human experience has been tainted with fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the future, fear of the things that we cannot control, fear of not having enough. This happens to us Christians even, even though we're not supposed to. We know it happens to us, right? Responsibilities pile up. We got lots of expectations, lots of things to do, and it can be overwhelming. We got bills to pay. We got children to raise, parents to provide for and to care for. There's no end to the list of things to do, and it can lead us to fear and to worry. And of course, there's always the what if monster that's lurking there in the shadows. What if I'm not good enough? What if I fail? What if I'm just a waste of space? What if uh, people find out how I really am, who I really am? What goes on inside my heart? What if the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with me or my loved one? What if there is no remedy, no solution? What if Pinky and the brain actually figured out how to take over the world? Anybody know that reference? No. I mean, there's lots of fear out there, right? We got pandemics, we got climate change, we got always the threat of nuclear war out there, and then we got, oh, what's the next one? Um, Alien invasion. Yes, that's what we have to be afraid of now. The aliens are coming. There's so much to be afraid of. And we as Christians, we know, we know the, the Bible says don't be afraid, and yet the fear gets us. It sneaks up on us. But also, we are people of faith, right? You've been baptized. You know God loves you. You believe in him. You believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for you. You know that you're going to be spending eternity with God in heavenly bliss. You're confident in that. You know that. You can't wait for that. You have faith. You you come because God bids you to come and hear his word and participate in his sacraments. You know who God is. You have faith in him. You believe in him. Fear and faith. A couple of characters in our gospel text for today struggled between these two realities of fear and faith. The first one is a guy by the name of Jairus. He was a ruler of a synagogue, and he knew fear. His daughter was ill to the point of death. And uh, any parent out there knows, knows how painful that could be to see your sick child. Like, oh, parent... Parents feel that so much. That's worse than your own illness and your own death to see a, see a loved one, see a child suffer this. And this is what Jairus was experiencing. He was terrified. He felt out of control, like, I can't help my daughter. He was fearful. But Jairus also had faith. He had faith that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, could do something about his daughter's condition. He believed. And this wasn't just like a you know, a feeling or an ephemeral hunch, but this faith was based on facts and evidence of the reports, the the eyewitnesses to Jesus' power and his healing power, to to the testimonies of people who actually had been healed by Jesus. And Jairus had faith that Jesus could do something for his daughter. So Jairus finds Jesus, and he falls down at Jesus' feet and says, Jesus, my daughter is sick and about to die But I know if you would just go and lay your hands on her, she would be made well. I believe in you. Fear and faith. Well, Jesus goes with Jairus, and they got this big crowd all around them. And then there's this woman who'd been struggling with the discharge of blood for 12 years. This woman knew fear and faith. If you imagine getting diagnosed with this. And all the questions that ran through her mind, all the fear that she felt. What does this mean? What is this going to do to my life? How is this going to affect my relationships? How is this going to affect my quality of life? 
Will I ever find a cure? For 12 years, she probably wrestled with this fear. But also had periods of faith of like, yes, I know this doctor. He's a specialist. He's going to cure me. He's done it before. And she goes to the doctor with faith that this doctor's going to have the answers. She gets the remedy. She tries the remedy. It doesn't work. Back and forth between fear and faith. Fear and faith. And then she hears the reports about Jesus too. She's like, if anybody can do something about my condition, it is Jesus. She believes Jesus can help her. She knows that all she would need, she believes that all she would have to do is touch the fringe of his garments and she would be made well. That's what she does. She sneaks through the crowd. She doesn't want to be known. She doesn't want anybody knowing her problems. And she goes and touches Jesus' cloak, immediately healed. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, immediate, miraculous healing. And this was one of my favorite parts. Jesus goes, who touched me? And the disciples are like, Jesus, uh, there's people all around you. What are you talking about? I think Jesus asked this question to give this woman an opportunity to share her faith, to share what God had done for her, how she has been transformed. Twelve years of issues, gone immediately. All the waiting, all the fear, now wells up into this awesome moment of faith for this woman. She believed. So her faith was probably up here, right? And then Jairus is watching this, and he's going, wow, I've seen it with my own eyes now. This man, Jesus, can heal people. He should for sure be able to heal my daughter, right? And so his faith is up here. Yes, I believe Jesus has the power. He's probably feeling really good at this point, and he's excited. Okay, let's go to my house now. Let's go. And before he can get to his house, what happens next? Some people come from his house, and they say, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? No. No. You can imagine Jairus at this moment. He went from faith up here to faith down here. Goodbye, faith. Hello, fear. Welcome back. I'd say I, I missed you, but I don't. Fear comes back. Fear probably overwhelms him at this point. Faith and fear. You know what this is like, right? You know what it's like to be struggling with fear and faith. Some moments you're confident, some moments you're not. The responsibilities of life, they pile up on you. Being, existence, life can just be a worrisome burden sometimes. And it's not like you go looking for fear. It's not like that's something you want. You don't want it. You don't look for it. It just happens to you. It comes upon you. And this is the mysterious and paradoxical thing about faith as well. It just comes. Faith just comes to you. It doesn't come when you decide to commit your life to Christ. It doesn't come when you decide to get your act together, clean up your life. No, the Bible's really clear about this teaching. Faith finds you. God works faith in the hearts of people when and where he pleases. And so it would appear, it would appear that we're just these contingent beings like succumbing to fear and faith at any given moment, right? Or do we? Do we have any control over these things? Well, here Jairus is, um, he's struggling with fear and faith. And Jesus, he heard the report that these people told Jairus. And he says to Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe, Jairus. You can imagine being Jairus at this moment. What? Don't fear. My daughter just died, Jesus, and you were supposed to do something about it. Don't fear. What, what is life going to be like without my daughter? She was only 12 years old. She had her whole life ahead of her. Now she's dead. How am I going to live without her? I'm sure the fear was gripping. And yet Jesus said, don't fear. Only believe. And he would not have said it if he didn't expect Jairus to do it. Isn't that interesting? God does not want you to flop around as a helpless victim. 
No room for victim culture in God's kingdom. God understands. He knows that there's going to be things that happen to you that are outside of your control that you did not expect, that maybe you didn't even deserve. Stuff's going to happen. But guess what? He still expects you to control the things you can control. That is your responses, your, your emotions, how you react to these things that happen to you. Jesus expects you to not be afraid and to believe. Do not fear, only believe. Fear is the enemy. Fear is a liar. And guess what? The evil one, he loves to stoke the flames of fear in people's hearts. And those who follow Satan, they also are in the business of stoking fear, making people afraid, because it's good for them. It's good for business in Satan's kingdom. God does not want that for you. Fear will keep you from being the person that God wants you to be. So do not fear, only believe. And if you are struggling with fear of this, that, or the other thing, I have two words for you today. You'll probably be able to remember them. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah, do not be afraid. Do not fear, only believe. God is in control. God cares about you. He's not going to push you more than you can handle. Do not fear, only believe. No room for helpless victim culture in the Christian faith. If you remember in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples, and he wants them to be informed and prepared for what they're about to do on their missionary journey. He says, uh, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get flogged. You're going to get bitten, scratched. Drug before governors and rulers and principalities, and guess what? There, some of you are even going to die for the sake of my name. But don't be afraid. Do not fear. Do not fear those who can destroy the body but can't touch the soul. Fear rather him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus tells his disciples. We are to put our fear, love, Trust, faith in God above all else. Do not fear, only believe. So that's what Jesus tells Jairus. Do not fear, only believe. And I'm sure Jairus heard these words and probably wasn't able to just put fear away right away. You know, the fear probably was still there, lingering a little bit. But he also had faith. He knew there's only one person who could help his daughter. It was a simple faith that Jesus could do something. And Jesus did something, right? Jairus and Jesus and some of his disciples went over to Jairus' house, and there the people were weeping and wailing, mourning the death of this little girl. And Jesus says to them, why are you weeping? That girl is not dead. She is sleeping. And the people laugh at him. Ha! Jesus, she's dead. She's lifeless. Jesus is like, okay, well, watch this. He takes... Jairus and his wife, Peter, James, and John, this intimate group, into this room with this little girl. Jesus walks to the, to the bedside, and he, he's next to her, and he says these two words, Talitha kumi. Talitha kumi. This is Aramaic. These are the exact words that Jesus said to this little girl. It must have made a pretty significant impact on the people who heard it, because at these words, this little girl was raised to life. Little girl, arise. She went from death to life at the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus can raise the dead. Can take dead people and make them alive. Just merely the words of Christ. Jesus' words are powerful and efficacious. Jesus' words do exactly what he says they're going to do. I remember being at the, the seminary and I had a question that came up in one of my classes, and as I was wrestling with the call to be a pastor, and one of them was, what is the point of preaching to the flock, like to the, to the baptized here? Week in, week out, some of you have listened to thousands and thousands of sermons, right? So what's the point of preaching to the flock over and over again? And I called up my dad, because he's been doing it for, you know, 35 years or so. Dad, why, why do you, what's the point of preaching? And without skipping a beat, 
My dad said to raise the dead. I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Tell me more. And he explained that the word of God can actually raise the dead. And guess what? Your people are going to go out into the world. They're going to get beat up. And the world's going to drag them down into sin, into disbelief, into doubt, into despair, spiritual decay. And they come into God's house to be made alive again, to receive the sacrament, to receive forgiveness, to be made alive again by the word of God and by the sacraments. The word of God is powerful. It can raise the dead. It's like That's pretty good. Pretty good answer. So there's plenty to be afraid of out there, folks. I mean, there's no end to the things you could worry about. But guess what? There's even a better reason to believe. An even better reason to have faith. Because Christ has overcome the world. Christ has conquered sin. He has conquered death. He has conquered the evil one, Satan. He has conquered fear. And if you let him, his word can drive out fear in your heart. The perfect love of Christ can drive out fear in your heart. He can, and he will, and he does. He has conquered. So his message for you today is do not fear, only believe. Amen. I invite you all now to stand as we confess our faith in the triune God. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings, which we will bring forward and place in the offering plates at the front. I also encourage you to fill out one of our Connect attendance cards that's found in the pew rack in front of you both our members and our guests alike. We worship our Lord at this time. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray. Holy Father, you have shown to your church the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became poor, that by his poverty we might become rich. Give us generous hearts, that our abundance may supply our fellow saints in their need. 
Let our preachers serve for the sake of Christ's call and not for earthly gain. Let those who have received excellence in faith, speech, knowledge, and every other gift of God's word provide richly for the preaching of the gospel and the work of the church. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, your compassion does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men, but your mercies are new every morning. Bestow your steadfast love on every Christian home. Turn parents in kindness to their children. Make children ready in obedience and love toward their parents and each other. Let the young learn discipline and trust in you, and let fathers not exasperate their children but be devoted to the fear and instruction of the Lord as examples to them. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, be with the governing authorities and enable them to persevere, preserve peace and order of our nation. Hear our prayers for our president, our governor, our military and police, and all other civil servants. Increase a spirit of unity and cooperation among the people of our land and the nations of the world. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you did not turn aside the bold request of Jairus, nor the timid faith of the woman. We implore you, hear our prayers for those in need. Drive away our fears and give us believing faith. Give healing and strength to the sick and suffering, especially those that we name now, for Pat Lindgren, for David Padaway, Michelle Smith, Hannah Hornan, Charlotte Mandelik, and for one of our youth who is suffering from cystic fibrosis. Give comfort to those who mourn with the knowledge that Christ has destroyed death. And all who die in him are only sleeping until you awaken them at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son used his divine power as a man on earth to heal and save. Bless all those who, are, who seek to carry out his mission in word and deed, especially Anne Jadalee, who is teaching English as a second language to students in Puerto Rico and all who were involved in that ministry of our church body. Lord, in your mercy. These and whatever else you know that we need, we would ask of you, O God. Grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, make us bold to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace.